Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco SY. We're having some fun today. We're getting to sit down with one of our heroes, Mr. Matthew Simmons, a controls engineer at Anco Rendering Equipment. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing good. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. So looking, really looking forward to digging in with you, man. And Matthew has had a chance to visit our branches and our connected power labs. So we've had a chance to meet in the past and work on some fun projects. And we really thought that, Matthew, you could just bring a lot of value to our listeners just because of the diverse experience background that you have. And maybe you can start us off by just telling us a little bit about how you got to the role that you're that you're currently in. I absolutely thank you for having me as a guest. Uh, I really appreciate it. But yeah, certainly, um, my journey in controls was really it was uh, kind of unprecedented. I graduated from Western Carolina University uh, with an electrical and computer engineering degree in December of 2010. And I actually didn't start my career until uh, 2012. At that time, I was putting applications in anywhere, everywhere, just trying to find a job. But I did not know anything about industrial automation, that this would be the career that I would be building. The funny thing about that is I had a former classmate named Michael Ramey, who I ran into while working another job. And, you know, he ultimately got me into systems integration and and industrial automation. And so that's how I got my start in in 2012. From there, uh, I worked in multiple roles, system integration roles, and I worked mainly with system integration companies. So that's really what my background has been up until this point in my career. And I even worked for a little while as a field service engineer Between 2013 and 2017, I built up a ton of controls instrumentation, knowledge and experience, controls commissioning experience, but I had a strong desire to to get more on the design side and be the engineer that actually creates the electrical design and does the programming and does the HMI development. I've been able to get bits and pieces of those skills along the way. Now being a controls engineer with Anko rendering equipment, it all comes together. I am the guy that is doing the electrical design, doing everything I pretty much wanted to do, the design, the programming, and even going out and commissioning the system when it's said and done. But that's pretty much a quick run through of my career up to this point. I mean, that's great, man. I mean, thank you so much. Now, Western Carolina, did you enjoy that? Uh, I would have enjoyed it more if it weren't so much construction going on. Oh, oh really? <laughs> At the time. Yeah, uh, being there from 2006 to 2010, a lot of what the campus looks like today, the construction, it was happening during that time. It's beautiful. Uh, it's overall, definitely beautiful out there in that part of the world, though, man, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely better now. I, I, I'll make, make no mistake about it. Western Carolina was mainly a decision for me from an educational standpoint. What I loved about going there academically was that the engineering school is a small one versus going to the to the big name universities for engineering like, you know, NC State, Clemson, et cetera. I, I kind of already knew what my learning style was. And for me, it was a better fit just being in a, in a smaller class where I actually had a working relationship with the professor rather than relying on group study, being in a query to get a question answered from the professor because it's like you and 500 other students in the class. <laughs> right. So uh, it was just a great experience for me in that regard. Well, hats off to you. I have two daughters. I told them I want one of them to go to Western Carolina and one of them to go to UNC in Wilmington. That I can go to the beach one weekend and to the mountains the next. But uh, that's that's for another topic, man. But <laughs> hats off to you, buddy. Yeah. But hey, you you mentioned something there I wanted to want to talk about learning style. You know, with your diverse background, 
you did say that you wanted to be on that design side as an engineer. You were on that integration side and the design side is definitely a different path. So your learning style, what are some ways that you adopt or things that, that help you with learning the design side? Visualization. I'm definitely a hands-on visual learner. I, I need to see it. I, I need to get my hands dirty, get a get a feel for it. So when I'm coming across a new concept, I need to be able to visually put it together for you know it to click in my my mind. So being on the design side, that for me was more of just wanting to complete the package as a controls engineer. You know, the thing with system integration, that part of the industrial automation industry is definitely good, but it's also very easy when you work with a systems integration company to get kind of like boxed in to a specific role. It's very easy to become specialized, if that makes sense. That does. So, that, yeah. I wanted to be able to be more well rounded. Every week is I'm presented with a, a different opportunity, a different challenge, and the same approach doesn't always equate to success right. for that particular application. So I'm, I'm still getting, I'm still learning how to adjust my learning style. So what is, you know, on that same path, what are some resources that you found that help you with that learning those new trades or those new skills? What would those be? Man, just te technical experts, honestly. And people, a lot of people just don't realize how, how close-knit the controls community can be. When you reach out or you just maintain the right relationships and you build the right relationships, that's often where you find the resources that you need. And, and it's very critical for my role because, again, like a benefit to my previous roles was I worked in a group. And then the focus was solely on that project, but typically you, there would be a project manager and then you would have a technical lead engineer and then you would have a support engineer, which is typically the role that I fell in. So if I had questions about programming HMI, how to build you know, the HMI application a certain way to the customer's benefit, if I had questions like that, I could immediately go to the technical lead in my group. In my current role, I don't have that luxury. So... If I run into something like that, just identifying and building a relationship with a technical expert in that area is just is crucial for me. Right. That's very good observation there. Is who you know and, and getting those answers is so important. You know, if you were to think about your relatively early in your career, there may be that listener yep. out there right now who is maybe they're just graduating from Western Carolina and they want to go into the engineering field, what would be some advice that you would offer up to help accelerate their path? Man, that's a great question. I would say, one, make sure this is something that you're passionate about, because if you're not passionate about it, you're, you're not going to achieve the success that you, that you want to obtain. Secondly, I would say just reach out, network, build relationships, because the knowledge is important. Who and how you get the knowledge, you know, is even more important. Resourcefulness is absolutely, in my opinion, a key to success in, in a role like mine, especially when you're you're working independently. You you have to you have to build those relationships and, and grow those relationships. Establish new relationships because you you never know at at any given point in your career where you know, that may become a benefit for you down the road. So hey, to, to that point, Matthew, this is a great opportunity. You definitely have called out how, how you learn and that network, how important that is to you. Would there be any people or, or shout outs you'd like to give to people who've been influential to you throughout your career? Sure. And one of those people I've already mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation, again, his name is Michael Ramey. Uh, he is a fellow catamount. And uh, I have to give him credit because, again, he, he got me into my career. And then I would also shout out uh, Scott Summer. He is a professional engineer. Uh, he's also a member of the International Society of Automation. He's a certified automation professional, and he's a technical fellow. And like he was a great brain to pick when I had questions. 
you know, I could go to him and, and ask him anything to help me be better at my job. And he would take the time out of his busy schedule to accommodate the question. Right. Very good. Well, I mean, thank you for mentioning those. It's very, yeah, it's important to recognize the people who help us in our careers. So it's, that was a great opportunity. And thank you for sharing that. You know, you're in a unique field and where a lot of our listeners are in that field as well. So where do you see as some of the, the biggest challenges in front of you right now going forward for, let's say, maybe the next five years or so? Yeah, well, definitely with the way things are, are currently are with COVID-19, the biggest change I can see, remote support for customers is, is something that I'm certainly trying to uh, push uh, with my current system designs. And, and what I mean by that is just being able to connect via VPN to uh, a control system that we would supply a customer and have the ability to immediately support them on their issues. It's a no-brainer in terms of cost savings and time savings. I remember taking a, a trip not long ago before the outbreak happened, just a service trip. And I just kept thinking to myself, how much time and money could have been saved if I was able to uh, remote into the control system and get it back up and going. So I think that's going to be, especially how society is going to very likely change because of COVID, it's going to be a big deal. So from that standpoint, Matthew, do you think COVID, I mean, it's, there's nothing positive about COVID. You know, I've got to be careful how I ask this, but maybe an enhancement to engineering would be the adoption rate of remote connectivity. You think that's going to help you win certain groups that were that are less agreeable to allow this to now with COVID see the importance of allowing remote connectivity into the control system? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the benefit is there with or without the existence of, of COVID. I think COVID just amplifies the importance of remote connectivity. Because again, at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about any and every customer's bottom line. And when an issue happens in their production system, whether it, it, it goes down entirely or a critical part of it goes down, they would much rather be able to reach out to a person like myself and me be able to begin assisting troubleshooting their issue within minutes versus hours and possibly days. Now, have you guys started, you know, working with this type of technology? How's that been going for you? Uh, it's been going great. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of it. It's a benefit for me and it's a benefit for the customer, as I've seen so far. At the end of the day, it, it makes so much sense to have that ability. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's, it's critical. And we've, we've had a couple of episodes on Eco Ask Why where we talk specifically about remote connectivity and importance of it. And, you know, then it gets tied back into, you know, security and things like that. So uh, hats off to you. I think it's going to, it's up and coming. It's, it's definitely in the forefront right now with the world that we're living in. The, the more that, you know, you get on top of it and, and stay in front of it, I think the better off, you know, your particular customers are going to, going to be and you're, you'll have a lot more fulfillment. So, uh, you know, what's something that, you know, if you want to, to, maybe talk about for a second that you enjoy at work. Where, when do you find yourself getting, you know, the most fulfillment? Oh, man. Yeah, I've got a couple examples of that. One, just seeing my system work. I think that's for any controls engineer. You know, you put in the hours, you toil and labor, you worry about getting the design right. So you go through all the steps. And so just to get to the finish line, be out there on the production floor and see your system work as you designed it and to the customer and specifications and satisfaction, like no, no feeling really beats that for me. But secondly, just learning something new or learning a, a new alternative or a new approach to accomplishing the same task. You know, and, and that for me, that brings me a lot of joy because it's it's so easy as a controls engineer to get caught into the, the technical part of the job. And that could get pretty boring. So if you're not inquisitive or, you know, kind of thinking, you know, well, how can I do this better or different way of doing the same thing? It, it gets redundant and the fun gets sucked out of the job. So 
I love learning about the, the technological advances in controls and any opportunity I have to learn new capability, added new capability to my toolbox. That also brings me a lot of joy. I mean, I think you nailed it just with that sense of achievement when you can sit back and see something that you design functioning the way that the requirements are from, from the, the scope of the job. Uh, that, that I think a lot of our listeners out there are probably smiling right now, Matthew. They're feeling, they're feeling you on this one, man. And let, until, you've, yeah. until you've been there and been the guy behind the keyboard and, and doing that design work, uh, it's hard to explain. So thank you for that. And just uh, it sounds like your passion for learning, too. That's going to take you very far, you know, in your career. And, you know, so what are you curious about right now? What are you studying to take you to that next level? Well, I would say for me, it's really more about improving my fundamentals, which is something that should always be on the forefront of any any professional. We always like to correlate this with professional players, right? Like, you know, what separates your all-stars from just the other guys on the roster? And really, when you, you look at it at the end of the day, it's those guys invested in the fundamentals, and that's how they became better and, and stronger. So right now, for me, a, a, a big goal is, you know, I say it all the time to myself, it's about becoming a, a stronger controls engineer. Well, you know, how, how do I go about doing that? Am I strengthening my fundamentals of, you know, PLC programming, HMI development? Am I improving the fundamentals that every controls engineer should have? You would be surprised that there are people out there that that don't even know what those fundamentals should be. Matthew, maybe to help us, just when you say fundamentals, explain that to our listeners. Okay, well, I'll give you the best explanation based on my experience because there will be, I'm sure there'll be listeners who are way more experienced in their years than I than I am, and that's that's totally fine. But when I say fundamentals, you know, for me. That, that speaks to having good design practices, electrical design practices. That's ground zero, the, ground, the basement level of the work. It, that's where it starts. You know, and then having good programming fundamentals. The majority of the programming that I do is in, you know, ladder logic and working in RS, you know, Logics 5000 because I primarily work with uh, Allen Bradley controllers. And then, you know, from there, just having some technical knowledge as well, like having a good understanding of the systems that you work with, that you design and you develop the control systems for. So in my case, my company fabricates a lot of the equipment that goes out into my control systems that are employed in my control systems. I need to make sure that I'm constantly improving my understanding of how those or those pieces of equipment work and how I should be able to effectively and uniformly control them. And can I even find better ways of controlling them in my control system? So for me, those are some of the key fundamentals. That helped a lot, Matthew. I mean, thank you for, for walking through that because fundamentals can be a lot, a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think you broke it down in yeah. a way that totally gets it. I mean, you really ultimately in a role like yours, you need to understand the requirements of the process too, to such an nth degree, because those little programming changes that you make, the big implications on the back end of the of the outcome of the process. So, absolutely. Well, let's take a uh, let's take a hard turn here, and go from working in the plant on designing new equipment that you do every day, and let's talk a little bit outside of your role. So, what's a hobby that you got? Oh man, hopefully. This is still around by the time everything blows over, but I am a craft beer enthusiast. I love craft beer. Uh, the local brewery scene um, has been getting better and better and better over the years up into, you know, this re- these recent events. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely something that, that I enjoy. And, you know, for me, it is a social activity. But aside from that, you know, I, I am into sports more so as not a not an analyst. I don't take it that far, but you know, I do enjoy keeping up with professional and college sports. And that's something that's been uh with me for a long time. I, I enjoy 
console video gaming when I can. Doesn't happen as often as I like, but every now and then I'm able to break away and and enjoy some time in front of my Xbox One S. Then, uh, I mean, traveling, but you know, my job definitely takes care of that for me. <laughs> I feel you there, man. So let, let's go back. What's your favorite craft beer spot? Uh, locally or just in general? Locally, if you had, you know, I know you're in the uh, the Greensboro area, correct? Yeah, that's a really tough one, man, because there's so many good microbreweries in the area. I, I would say right now my top two are Red Oak and uh, actually South End Brewing Company, which is one of the the newer ones that have opened. Um, I was a huge, huge fan of Br- Prayer Brewing Company, but they unfortunately closed down back in. February of this year, so that that was gut wrenching for me. I got you, man. Now, how about the uh, the sports? You mentioned you know you're a pretty big sports guy. So, what are your teams? Who do you, who do you follow? Uh, I'm all over the place. Uh, just starting with the NFL, I do follow the Indianapolis Colts. That's been my NFL team since I really started following football seriously back in the early 2000s. You know, as a teenager. For uh, NBA, uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder. I've actually been to Chesapeake Energy Arena and got to see Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook before they left the team. That was a very neat experience for me. Uh, let's see, MLB. I, I, I'm a little late on baseball, but I've gotten it more into baseball in the recent years. Just kind of started building my interest on the minor league level. So, you know, locally, I've I've definitely been to uh, my fair share of Greensboro Grasshopper games and Winston Salem Dash games. But so for the, but for the MLB, you know, I follow uh, the Chicago White Sox. I've actually been to Guaranteed Rate Field uh, on a home opener. Uh, I would not recommend it. <laughs> okay. That's nothing against the team. I'm born and raised in the South, so being in the snow uh, in the front end of April, it was just like, you know, very unusual for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're all over the place, man, with the Colts, Oklahoma City Thunder, and the uh, the White Sox, man. You, you're all over the map when it comes to your sports teams. That's awesome, though, that – you got to see Durant and uh, Westbrook play together. I bet that was a an awesome experience. Yeah, well, I got to see Durant. Unfortunately, that was his. Uh, he was injured, so he wasn't playing. But I did get to see him on the sideline. Uh, but I did see, you know, Westbrook and, and Serge Ibaka and Stephen Adams. I saw all of them playing on the court. But yeah, I mean, the correlation between all of that, all three of those teams, is you know they're small markets. That's the tie-in. You know, I, I root, you know, for the underdog, the small market teams. It's just a thing with me. Well, I try, I'll try to recruit you over to the Braves, uh, but we can do that later, man. Uh, you know, but uh, just yeah, something yeah, to think you're about. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so how about travel, man? What, what are some cool places you've, you've been able to to, uh, to go to and experience? Man, where do I start? Personally, you know, actually going to Chicago was a great trip for me. You know, I I haven't been to the Midwest often. I have been to Indianapolis for a Colts game. That was actually Andrew Luck's rookie year that I went to Lucas Oil Stadium. So that was a cool trip. Chicago was a cool trip, as I mentioned. Internationally, before two years ago, I'd never been to Europe. But I, I got to go within a matter of a week and a half. I got to go to Milan, Italy, uh, London, and, and actually bring in my, my 30th birthday under the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So that was the coolest trip experience for me as far as personal trips are concerned. And just getting to see that that part of the world, you know, business wise, you know, I've been all over the southeast within the states. You know, my coolest trip was at, last year I got to go to Kalamazoo. There, I actually got to visit Bell's Brewery. For me, that was a cool experience. But the coolest trip professionally I've made last year, back in December, I got to go to Pakistan. Nice. Right. And it was a very enlightening experience for me. Of course, the, the travel, the, the physical travel, like, wore me out. But <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, just just the, the, the cultural experience and just being in that part of the world was very eye-opening and enjoyable for me. Very good. 
So Matthew, this is a this is a twofold question. You can answer it uh, both ways. I'd like to, to to get your take from working inside your role, and then outside outside uh, just you personally at at your house. If you had an extra, right. if you had an extra big bucket of cash, and you could spend it on anything inside the plant, and then we could do we could do the same thing outside. What would that? What would you spend it on? Work related, I would say just I would spend it on building up my test lab. Because the the more knowledgeable I am about the the products and the hardware that I use and my control systems, you know, the the stronger I'm going to be, the better I'm going to be uh, as a controls engineer, the more efficient I'm going to be for my customers. So that that definitely would be what I would spend the extra money on. Outside of that, vacation. No limitations on how big this bucket is. I, you know, just to clarify. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well. Shoot. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, I would still say that would be it for me, you know, professionally, because I mean, again, it plays such a important role as product selection is, in my opinion, becoming more important, like how you actually design the control system electrically and, and, and physically, you know, is becoming more and more important as, you know, automation continues to advance. As, as you know, you know, Chris, you know, VFDs, soft starts they're they're becoming more powerful more efficient yet you know slimmer and smaller to save that that key space in the control panel if you could develop the same system and the difference in having to uh put it all in a two-door control cabinet versus a single door you know that's that's a huge premium in space especially in my I'm, i'm learning that's particularly true in in my industry Okay. Um, now, how about uh, but yeah, but, get outside the plant? If it, if you could use that bucket for you, what would it be? Yeah, I'm still going to stick with my first word I blurted out, which was vacation. <laughs> that works. Um, yeah, and personal career development. Right. Um, there's got to be a balance, and I, and I'm just completely honest. I've never saw myself as a person that just can work, 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 and not take a break. Right. You mentioned balance. That, that's so important, man. You know, you got to be able to strike that, right? Yeah, it's, it's a necessity, especially in my role. It's, it's, it's an absolute necessity because, again, it's so easy to get burnt out. Yes. Um, and and one, of the, one of the ways of me being able to maintain my, my passion and excitement about what I do and, and why I do it is, you know, to be able to take those mental breaks. Um, Because the work is going to be there no matter what. It's always going to be there. That's right. Well, Matthew, just to kind of wrap us up, we always like to get to this question on Eco Ask Why. And we're trying to inspire people to to give them an insight to other people's journeys and their careers. And we always like to get down. We like to get down to the purpose, to the why. So if you had to answer what your personal purpose is behind being a controls engineer, just being an engineer in general, what drives you? What What is your personal why? Great question, Chris. Uh, I actually have two answers for you. One answer is my family. I'm a father of two wonderful boys. Being a controls engineer, being an industrial automation has allowed me to build a a blueprint of what success could look like for them, you know, as, as, as black men. It's definitely a, a big driver for me. And then on uh, top of that, or in addition to that, I always knew I wanted to do something hands-on. I always knew, you know, from high school, I never wanted a desk job. And this is exactly that. And, and then some, I get paid to travel. I get, in some instances, I get paid to learn. To I get to invest in my career. And that keeps me going as well. I never thought that this career would be everything that I was exactly looking for personally from a professional standpoint, if that makes any sense. It does. It does, Matthew. And you really brought your purpose to light right there. You know, there's so many eyes. I think there's so many of our listeners that probably are smiling and they're thinking, you know, their personal drive aligns very well with what you just stated. So, Matthew, this has been a total joy, man. I really uh, think you brought a ton of value to our listeners. 
There are a lot of people that are on career paths like yourselves and they want to, they're maybe in still in school or they want, maybe they're in the plant and they want to go back to school and figure out how do you get to that controls engineer role. And uh, you've really, you know, painted a good path. So, so thank you so much for taking the time with us, man. Thank, yeah, thank you, Chris. And if I could add just one one final thing, um, there was an actual third thing that came to mind about why I do it, but I think it could be, um, you know, paying it forward as a controls engineer, as a industrial automation engineer is something I certainly plan to do, you know, as soon as I can. I don't even want to say, you know, I'm trying to wait for a certain point in my career. But, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that I have now, obviously, that I I, I would have loved to have had, you know, back in 2012 and 2013 when I was really, really just getting started and sharing the knowledge uh, within, you know, the com- our, our community of, of automation professionals is is so important. So for anyone listening to this podcast, you know, I strongly encourage them if they know a younger up and coming engineer or if they are a younger and up and coming engineer, pass that knowledge down or network to go in and seek that knowledge. What there, I've been fortunate to have, you know, much more experienced and, and seasoned engineers willing to help me. And, you know, in turn, um, I'm always looking for an opportunity to do the same. Absolutely. And, you know, right here, you just by being on this podcast, Eco asked why, you know, this was, I think you paid it forward right here with our listeners. And so hats off to you. You know, thank you again. You've been a great guest. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hey, Chris, thank you again so much uh, for having me as a guest. It's uh, truly an honor, and I, I really do appreciate the opportunity. Yes, sir. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.